imagine you're a parent and you have an 11-year-old child who's leaving elementary school and about to go to middle school, but you're not satisfied with a middle school option in your neighborhood. And there are some other schools in the city, selective magnet schools that you can test into, but your child doesn't have the test scores to get into one of those schools. And you don't have the money to send your child to a private school. What do you do? For many years in New Orleans, we've had three school systems. We've had private schools, academically selective public schools, and open admission schools. And in the first two categories of schools, most of the students graduate from high school. But in the open admissions public schools, prior to 2005, far fewer than 50% of students graduated from high school. Now, the open admission schools face a much more complex challenge with a much greater range of needs. But many people in the city had lost faith that we could have good public schools for all students. In 1992, I had the privilege of working with Dr. Tony Rakasner and a group of parents to help found a middle school. It was called James Lewis Extension School. And we founded the school because the parents were deeply frustrated with the lack of even adequate options for middle school for their children. Six years later, that school became the first charter school in the city, New Orleans Charter Middle School. And when we became a charter school, and a charter school, by the way, is just an independent public school with its own board of directors that operates largely uh, free of the system bureaucracy. And when we became a charter school, that first year we took in 120 new sixth grade students. And we had about four applicants for every spot. So we did a lottery. And we used one of those, uh, those wire hand-cranked church bingo machines filled with ping pong balls. And there was a ping pong ball with a number on it for every student who'd applied. And we'd roll the machine and a number would come out. And parents, by the way, they didn't have to show up to the uh, lottery in order to get in, but the cafeteria was packed. And so we'd hold up a ping pong ball and call out the number, and parents would jump up and hug each other. One woman fell on the floor and said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Another guy jumped up and he dashed out through the cafeteria doors out into the parking lot and he danced a jig and yelled at the sky. And it was all deeply affirming of the work we were doing until we got to the 110th ball and then the 115th ball and the cafeteria was dead silent and it was filled with, with people who were sitting there praying or staring at the bingo machine willing for their ping pong ball to come out. And we got to the 120th ball and the 121st ball, which was number one on the wait list. And the 122nd ball was number two on the wait list and on and on past any hope of ever getting in. And people stayed until their ping pong ball came out, even then, because they wanted to make sure their ball had been in the lottery. And I'd, I'd known it before, but I'd never felt it as deeply as, as that night how profoundly unfair our system of public education was in New Orleans because a child's educational chances shouldn't depend on a lottery. Now, in the years leading up to 2005, our system of public schools was desperately broken. There were good schools and there were great leaders and teachers across the system. But the challenges of working in this broken system that was financially bankrupt, riddled with corruption, and with a stifling bureaucracy and collective bargaining agreement that handcuffed school leaders and teachers and distracted them from prioritizing the needs of students, those challenges were too great to overcome. It was really, it was, it was like farming on concrete. It doesn't matter how much fertilizer you put down and how much you water the plants and how good the seeds are and how hard the farmers work. At the end of the day, it's hard to grow things on concrete. And there were a few exceptional principals who'd torn up their patches of concrete and grown gardens. And in every school, there were some outstanding teachers. But for most folks who are working in this broken system, the challenges 
presented by farming on concrete, the obstacles that the system continually threw in people's way were too great to overcome. And so as a result, far too many students received a substandard education. Following the collapse of the levy system that Rod just uh, described in August 2005, several critical things happened that would shape the future of public education in New Orleans for the next 10 years. The first was that the Orleans Parish School Board, not knowing when the city would recover, declared that the schools were closed for the remainder of the 2005-06 school year. They sent an email to the central office staff and to the principals, and the email read, you can pick up your final paycheck from the Western Union, your benefits will run through October, principals are responsible for notifying their staff. And just like that, thousands of teachers and school leaders, many of whom had dedicated years and decades to serving students and families in our community, were laid off. Now, as the schools came back, so did many of those veteran leaders and teachers, and they would form the foundation of the rebuilding of schools in New Orleans. But it's also important for us to acknowledge that many of the teachers and leaders were never rehired as the system came back, and the pain and dislocation of that needs, that we need to acknowledge that. The second critical thing that happened was that the state legislature empowered the recovery school district to take over all of the schools in New Orleans below the state average because they declared New Orleans a failed district. Now, most of the schools in New Orleans were failing, and so as the recovery school district took over those schools, it was taking over the majority of public schools in New Orleans. The third critical thing that happened is that we did have education in New Orleans, public education in 2005-06. Because as families started coming back to the city, veteran teachers and leaders came back and fought and worked hard to reopen their schools. And, and many of these schools, they converted into charter schools. And these schools that these veteran teachers and leaders opened, later they were joined by committed educators and teachers from around the country who came in. And, it was, and it's that mix of veteran folks and new folks to the city who've been responsible for the progress that we've made. Following over the next 10 years, the Recovery School District um, decided to convert most of its schools into charter schools. The theory of action was that the charter schools, these independent public schools, would be able to operate more effectively than if they were directly run by the recovery school district or the traditional district. And so they converted these schools and we ended up over time with a system of schools instead of a school system. And this system of schools is characterized by three things. Autonomy. Schools have the freedom to do their own staffing, to set their own curriculum, to do the operations the way they want. The biggest thing they have is the freedom to make the thousands of little changes that need to be made every week and every month and every year in order to create a great school. The second thing that happened was accountability. The recovery school district is actually a pretty simple idea, but it's a simple idea that's been rare in American public education because it requires enormous political will to say, here's the bar of what an acceptable standard of public education is. And if we don't meet that bar, someone else is gonna run the school or it's gonna close. And that applies to both charter schools and to traditional district schools. And by having that bar, the state is basically saying a traditional school district no longer has a monopoly on operating schools if it can't meet a certain standard of education. And the same is true for a charter school. The third thing that happened in the new system was parent choice. Parents now can apply to any school in the city. And while we still have a long ways to go to make higher quality options and a greater variety of options, parents have far more choice than they had before. So what's been the result of creating a system of schools with autonomy, accountability, and choice? In 2005, 
62% of students in New Orleans attended failing schools. In 2015, that number is down to 7%. In two, in 2005, 35% of students, about one-third of students were in third through eighth grades were achieving at or above grade level on the state tests, and that's 23 percentage points back then below the state average. Over the last 10 years, the schools of New Orleans have improved until this past year when nearly two-thirds of students were achieving at or above grade level only six points below the state average. And the same is true for students with disabilities, where once in 2005 we had 11% of students with disabilities in third through eighth grades achieving at or above average on the state tests. Over the last 10 years, we've improved to 39%, just two percentage points below the state average. And the graduation rate has improved as well, going from 54% to 73%. Also worth noting is that many of the open admissions public schools in New Orleans now out academically outperform many private schools. The, sc the schools have improved enormously in the last 10 years. But what we've really done is we've gone from an F to a C. We've gone from unsatisfactory to satisfactory. And now, how do we create great schools? How do we go from satisfactory to good, to great. Great schools where every student is college or career ready. Great schools where students learn about life in English class and on the playing field. Great schools where in, in our city, in our unique city of New Orleans, we, these, the schools should protect and pass on the cultural traditions of the city. Great schools that believe in developing the teachers as well as the students and schools that believe in the potential of every child. This is the back of Samuel J. Green Charter School uh, shortly after the floodwaters receded in the fall of 2005. And you can see the boat that's washed up there. It's sitting on the concrete in the back of the school. Shortly after this picture was taken, teachers, parents, students, Neighbors, volunteers from around the country came to Green and they tore up the concrete and, they, and they, they planted a garden. They planted a garden with vegetables and flowers and grapevines and where the concrete once was, a garden now grows. And this garden isn't the only one in the city. All across the city now, Schools have ripped up the concrete and created gardens that are growing. We've gone through a great tragedy as a city, and there has been a lot of pain, but there's also been enormous progress. And we'll never know how much more successful the schools in New Orleans could have been in the 10 years prior to Katrina if people had been able to operate in a different system. But now that we have that chance, we should collectively challenge ourselves to come together as a city and work to the day when every child goes to a great school. Thank you.